everyone and welcome to a new video. Today's video is one that I am really excited about but also quite nervous about. As I'm sure you can tell from the title and the thumbnail, today I'm going to be making a hoop skirt. Specifically an early version of a hoop skirt which would be historically accurate for dresses from the latter half of the 1950s. Hoop skirts have been around for hundreds of years and were originally called steel petticoats. They were worn in the 18th century and better known as panniers before they developed into the circular, very large skirts that we know today. And these were most popular in the 1850s and the 1860s, and they were invented in their current form in the latter half of the 1850s. Now this video is actually sponsored by Skillshare, and it's one in a series of three that they will be sponsoring in the coming months. And I will talk about them in more detail later on, but they're an online learning community. So every time I work with them, I try to push myself to learn something new and to take on a project that intimidates me. And hoop skirts definitely scare me a little bit. Their construction process is completely different from these skirts or petticoats that go over top of them. They're usually supported with a series of tapes, and even if they're not, then it's really difficult to get an idea of what the finished thing will look like until you have it all sewn together and all of the boning cut for it. And the materials for these projects tend to be pretty expensive too. So it's just something that I've held off on doing, even though I really love the 1860s and I really want more historically accurate skirt supports for that period. So getting sponsored by Skillshare is kind of the push I needed to order the pricey, pricey materials for these projects and also push myself to actually construct these and share the process with all of you. Now I, this is going to be a mixture of a vlog slash tutorial slash making a video. I definitely don't know entirely what I'm doing but I really want to share the entire process both the positives and the negatives, of which I'm sure there will be many with all of you. So in today's video, I'm specifically going to be making a late 1850s hoop skirt. And in the next video, I'll be making an 1860s elliptical hoop skirt. In the next video, I'll be making an early 1870s bustled hoop skirt. So we will be going through three decades of hoop skirts throughout this little mini series, and hopefully I will have lots of skirt supports for lots of pretty dresses. Since I am making an early version of the hoop skirt, it's a little bit difficult to collect references. I know roughly what shape the hoop skirt should be just based off of the shape of dresses from that period, but actually getting images of the hoop skirts that went underneath them is a little bit tricky. So I'm just going to flip the camera around and show you my references and then we can get started. So reference number one are these hoop skirts from Nancy Bradfield's costume in detail. These hoops are all inserted into primarily the hems of the skirts and these are entirely fabric hoop skirts so they're almost constructed like a petticoat, they just have hoops in the hem. Now this is a later version of a hoop skirt. Uh, the earliest hoop skirt I could find a patent for that resembled what I wanted to make was this one and you can actually look up this patent on Google Patents which is kind of cool. So this was patented in February 8, 1859 and it has the shape that I'm looking for where it's almost like a cupcake shaped hoop skirt. So it's not the typical A-line that we know from modern times. It has quite a lot of volume straight out from the hips and straight out from the waist which I think is really interesting but I'm a little bit intimidated by the fact that this is made entirely out of steel so I think I'm going to combine that shape with this construction method at least for the bottom half. So I'm going to have the bottom maybe four or three or five bones inserted into channels that are sewn to fabric which will support the hem of the skirt and then the upper portion will be constructed like this. Uh, now I'm going to come up with my own measurements for this just because I'm pretty tall and I want this to match my proportions. And the big reason why I haven't made a hoop skirt before is because a lot of the patterns out there that break down the process and make it seem somewhat doable aren't really in the shape I want my hoop skirt to be. So I feel like it's just best for me to start from scratch and make some mistakes along the way. Also chapter two of Norwa's Courses in Crinoline talks in great detail about petticoats and how they came to be, how they transitioned from a proper petticoat to a crinoline and to a hoop skirt and to a bustle. And he also has patterns for those. So these are what we're going to be following later on in this series. This I think is going to be part two and this is going to be part three with some adjustments to make it better fit my proportions. Uh, but this is what we are going to be focusing on today. My materials for this include some cotton, then I also have some tool tape. I've got boning casing, which I'm going to use to create the boning channels. Then I have the actual boning and I will link where I purchased this from down below. So in Nancy Bradfield's book, this hoop skirt says it has a width around the hem of 70 inches, whereas this one says it has a width around the hem of 90 inches. So I just set up my tape measure around the bottom of my dress form for 70 inches, and that is way, way too small. That's 96 inches, and that still looks too small for me. So I'm going to get out another measuring tape and add a little bit more to this. I'm thinking I'm going to be close to like 120, but we'll have to wait and see. I realized I didn't show you my references for the skirts that I'll be putting over top of this or the dresses I'll be putting over top of this, and I feel like that 
helps make the size and scale of this petticoat make a little bit more sense. So I will link this page down below. But as you can see, these dresses are very fluffy and very full. So I went ahead and added another 22 inches and this looks a lot better for me uh, in terms of overall size. So I think the magic number for me is going to be 118 inches around the hem. So I just did a bunch of planning and unfortunately my camera was off for a whole bunch of that, but this is my very rough plan. So basically all I've decided on so far is that I wanna cut the bottom hem portion to be 125 inches long and that's all have a little bit to overlap to make it look seamless at the back. Uh, it's going to have a finished overall circumference of 120 inches and then I want it to be 7 inches wide finish which means I have to cut it to be 8 inches wide to allow for half inch hem on both sides. So I think I'm going to get that cut out and get the boning into that first and then maybe cut the tapes and the tapes are these portions going vertically and I think originally these would have been made out of steel at this point but they were made out of tapes or fabric later on. By tapes I mean twill tape and that way the petticoat can collapse so it can be completely flat and very portable. Uh, whereas if these are made out of steel the petticoat kind of has a mind and body of its own. It is not going to collapse past that shape unless you have hinges in it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make this bottom part out of fabric and then I'm going to make these pieces out of either twill tape or boning channel. They feel very, very similar. I did order 100 yards of twill tape, but I don't think it's gonna arrive on time, which sucks. So I might have to use the boning channeling instead, even though it's significantly more expensive than the twill tape. So that's what these vertical pieces are going to be, and then all of these are going to be the bones. I'm going to be primarily using uh, half inch wide bones, but near the top I might have to use smaller ones. It just depends. So now I have a 125 inch by eight inch strip to cut out. I ended up cutting three 8 inch strips that were the full 44 inches of the fabric wide. They were pinned, then sewn together with French seams. And I trimmed the strip down to 125 inches after sewing the pieces together. I also top stitched the seam allowance down so I didn't have to worry about it interfering with the boning channel. Now I'm marking a line one inch away from each edge of the strip on the right side of the fabric. The raw edge will be turned up until it touches this line to form an even half inch hem. But first, I'm turning the ends inward and overlapping them, then sewing them together so that the strip becomes a loop, a loop that is 120 inches round. And now I'm folding the edges outward so they touch the line. And since the strip is cut on the straight grain line of the fabric, I wasn't worried about it shifting or warping while I sewed, so I didn't bother pinning this. Now on what will be the bottom edge of the skirt, I'm sewing on some eyelet lace trim. This probably isn't historically accurate, but it's cute, and I sneak ruffles in wherever I can. And now I'm covering the raw edge and top of the lace with the boning casing. This is sewn down on both sides as close to the edges as I can. Now I'm marking the points for the vertical tapes on the upper edge of the loop. And since there are 12 tapes and my loop is 120 inches around, these points were spaced 10 inches apart. As for the tapes, I want to use twill tape, but for reasons previously mentioned, I'm using narrow boning casing instead. And I wasn't sure how long these needed to be, so I overestimated and made them 55 inches long, then cut off a lot of excess before attaching the waistband. But that's better than them being too short. And I cut 12 of these. Now I'm folding that top edge of the loop outward and stitching the tapes over top of the marked points as I go. And I tended to backstitch over the tapes too, just to make sure they were nice and secure. And this is all being done on the right side of the fabric so that the boning channel will cover it. But first, to match the bottom of the loop, I'm adding the eyelet lace ruffle to this edge as well. And now I'm sewing the boning casing to the top edge covering all the raw edges and creating a pocket for the boning. The boning casing is actually two stiffened layers of twill sewn together, so it creates a pocket for the boning, even without me attaching it to anything. And I'm making sure the casing overlaps itself by several inches at the end. So 
So after about an hour of sewing, this is what I'm left with. I got the band cut out as you saw, and then I folded the edges inward by a half inch, stitched that down, stitched some eyelet lace around either edge, and then stitched the boning channels in place. I also sewed on all of the tapes, which will support the rest of the skirt. The lace I used on this is just one that I picked up in Lancaster. It was like $3 for the whole bolt of it, so I felt fine using it for a foundation garment. And now I've actually just cut out the two bones for this piece, so I'm going to get those inserted into the channels and then start pinning it to my dress form and figuring out the placement for the remaining bones, of which there are at least 10, probably more than 10. And I cut these pieces out to be about 10 inches longer than the boning channels, just in case. So I have lots of extra, uh, since it's much easier to trim off boning to make it fit the channel than it is to add boning, which is effectively impossible. Basically, you just have to recut the piece. And when I was cutting these, I also made sure to round the edges. And that way, these edges aren't sharp and they won't poke through the channel. So this basically avoids the need to file them or to tip them, as long as you're really careful about cutting them to have a rounded edge. And I just used 10 steps to do this. It's a little bit fiddly. It's not the quickest method but it does work uh, you just have to play with it for a little bit so I'm gonna get these inserted into the channels and we'll see what the shape looks so like. So this is my hoop skirt in its current state and I realize it doesn't look very impressive so there are a few things I'm really unhappy with this starting with how far apart the bones are and also just how uneven it is I did do some measuring but I wasn't happy with how it looked so I did a bunch by eye and it's just not working but this has given me a good idea of the overall size of the hoops needed so I think I can go in and figure out the exact lengths I need for each hoop and then I can figure out the space for the vertical bands to make sure that everything ends up being perfect. So I think that's what I'm going to do now. I kind of started that, but I've realized that I need to add more hoops to get the proportions to be the same for mine. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and figure out where to do that. All right, so this is my plan, and hopefully later tonight when I get home, I get all of the bones cut to these lengths. The top one is seven inches apart, and then I think all of the other ones are going to be separated by three inches. And that's going to give me a much denser, uh, more structurally solid hoop. And to figure out the placement of these vertical bands, I'm going to divide each of these measurements by 12 and then mark the horizontal bands uh, at those points. So I kind of tried to do that here, but it didn't work out very well. So I'm really excited about this. I'm feeling a lot better having this written down, having something to stick to. So I went ahead and did the division, or I used my phone and the calculator to do the division. You know, same thing. And I actually made little templates for all of the marks that I have to make. And this way, there's less margin for error because I won't be fiddling around with the ruler. I'm just marking both ends of these. So I have one for every single one. And yeah, I should be all set to get these cut out later tonight. And wish me luck because this is not what I want to look like. So we need to have some improvement going on this evening. So it is a day later, and this is what I'm currently working with. I don't know if you'll be able to see me in the mirror, but the 1950s dress has gone and been replaced with pajamas. So last night I managed to get half of the bones cut out for the hoop skirt, and I also got them inserted into the channels, and then I went ahead and sewed the channels closed. So each bone is cut to be about two inches longer than the length I want it to be, and then it is overlapped at the ends. The bone encasing is tucked around the ends so the ends can't escape. So I'm cutting each bone to be two inches longer than the measurement I actually want it to be. And then the boning casing is cut to be about an inch or two inches longer than that. So as you can see, these have all been overlapped and then I've just whip stitched the edges together uh, to make sure it won't come undone. And then they are inserted to the underside of this structure and tacked down. And then the thread is tied off and then I jump down to the next one and the next one, the next one. And these are all spaced three inches apart. And I realize it's looking super lopsided and awful at this point, but that's because the tapes at the top aren't even and they aren't providing an even amount of tension. It should look much better once that's the case. That just isn't going to be the case for a while. So I've done the bottom bone, which is the 118 inch bone, the 112 inch bone, 108 inch bone, and the 100 inch bone. And I think I'm actually going to do another 100 bone to try and keep the shape um, in the direction I want it to be, which is really wide and not that traditional A-line look. So to accommodate that, I went ahead and changed some of my other measurements. These guys are the top three bones. So that is the 44 inch, the 60 inch, and the 70 inch. But I'm going to be cutting out another 100 inch bone, a 90 inch bone, and 80 inch bone on camera and sharing the whole process of installing those with all of you. So I need to charge this camera battery because it's flashing at me and then I can get to cutting the bones out. So I went ahead and I positioned a measuring tape across my table. I've been using that as a guide for cutting these out. So I actually just changed my mind again and I'm going with my original measurements. So this boning channel needs to be for a 90 inch bone. So I'm going to measure out 45 inches and then double that. And then I'm going to extend that four inches beyond. So it's going to be a 94 inch channel approximately. And then I'm just going to take a fabric marker and I'm going to write the measurement on it. And the next one is going to be 80. 
So measuring to 40, doubling it, adding four. And then of course labeling it so I don't get confused. And the last one is 75 inches, so 35, 44. Label that as well. So now it is time to repeat that process with the boning, which means I can set aside my sewing scissors and get out my tin snips. These are what tin snips look like, by the way. And I'm only unfurling the amount of boning that I need because it gets pretty out of hand uh, if you clip the zip tie. Like, I have a cut on my knee and my foot from accidentally doing that yesterday. So I will start with the smallest bone and then trimming it and trimming the corners until it's rounded. And you might want to wear safety glasses while you do this. Now I can find the appropriate channel and get it inserted. So as planned, there should be extra on both ends. So what I'm gonna do is fold that extra outward on one side, like so, and inward on the other side, like so. And then I'm just going to lock the ends by two inches and use binder clips to hold it in place until I get a chance to sew it. And I'm just gonna repeat this for all the remaining bones and then I will come back and do the stitching. So here that sewing process begins and I'm just using whip stitches to secure overlapped portions of the boning casing together. These stitches extend around both edges of the casing as well as the ends. And this really needs to be done by hand unless you are very brave and unafraid of broken needles. And the reason I'm overlapping these ends is to help the hoop wire take on a circular shape. If you have them meeting up exactly, there will be a break in the tension at the joint point and it will take on more of a teardrop shape instead of being circular. I think you can avoid this by using hoop connectors, but I find overlapping them to be less troublesome than installing those. Now I'm taking the templates I cut earlier and using them as a guide for marking the vertical tape placement on each hoop. So I'm just marking both ends, then moving it along so one end lines up with the previous marking and marking the other end. This was repeated 12 times for all of the hoops. I'm so glad that I made these templates, though some of these markings were spaced in even 6 or 5 inches apart. Some were spaced 6.83 inches or something really difficult to reliably mark on a curved surface with a flimsy measuring tape. This this took a lot of the stress out of this step and saved some time too. And I found the measurement for each of these by dividing the hoop length by 12. Super simple. And now I'm using another paper template to mark the distance between the hoops onto the vertical tapes. And if I planned everything out beforehand, I could have marked this on the tape before sewing them onto the bottom hoops, but I didn't. But it's fine, this template made it quick to mark, even if it isn't the ideal angle to be marking things at. And this template is just a piece of paper cut to three inches, nothing fancy. And I'm lining it up with the top of the previous marking, then marking the upper edge. And now the hoop can be placed underneath the vertical tapes and pinned in place. And I'm just matching up the markings on the hoop with the markings on the tapes and pinning them together at each point where they meet. I only planned to pin three of these on camera, but I was concerned with the shape of the hoop. So I ended up marking the remaining guidelines onto vertical tape and pinning the rest of the hoops on. And oh boy, am I glad that I did. All right, so please don't mind the weird angle, but this is the current state of it. So I got all of the pieces pinned on and I haven't sewn the top eight top six maybe, rows on just yet, they're just pinned. And I'm glad that I pinned them before sewing them because I don't like the shape right here. I like how it flares out from the waist, even though that's probably not completely historically accurate, but I don't like how flat it is here before dipping outward again here. So I think I'm going to move this bone so it's here and it slants out to be slightly wider from this point. And then I'm going to cut a slightly longer bone to go there, assuming I like the shape once I add that. So I'm gonna make that little switch and I'll show you what it looks like uh, and then I will potentially have to cut out another bone and repeat some of these steps, but it'll be worth it if that improves the shape since the shape is the only purpose of making a hoop skirt. Okay, so this is what I'm dealing with now. It looks so much better. This is kind of the same angle I was taking it from before, which is weird and in my mirror, but I've gotten rid of the majority of the dippage, or at least the dippage around the top, which is where it's going to be most visible. Uh, and there are gonna be several petticoats over top of this. So the slight dipping you see between the channels is something that I'm okay with. 
Uh, I'm using wider bones than historical examples, and since I don't have the medical vertical pieces, I can't half bone channels and do crazy stuff like that. So I feel like all things considered, this is a pretty good representation, and it's a pretty good shape for the period. I'm really excited to get fabric and to make a dress and a petticoat to go over top of this, because I've wanted a hoop skirt like this for so long. But there's a lot of work left to be done. Uh, do you see everywhere where these meet? So we're all... 13 bones meet the 12 vertical pieces. Yeah, those all have to be hand stitched together. So that is going to be my next task and it is a time consuming task indeed. But once that is done, all it needs is a waistband and then we can get this thing finished and get working on a dress to go over top of it. So that is going to be for another video, if it ends up being a video at all. Today we're just focusing on the hoop skirt. I was not kidding when I said this was time consuming. The vertical tapes were tacked to the hoop at each corner where they meet using whip stitches. Then the thread was tied off and clipped. This only took two minutes or so, but had to be done over a hundred times. The boning casing is also pretty thick and not the best to stitch through by hand. Paired with the awkward angle of sewing something, well, shaped like a hoop skirt, made it kill my back. So I took lots of breaks, but I still had this step done in a day. A long day, but a day nonetheless. I get asked sometimes why I don't stream my sewing process, but would you really want to watch this four hour process in real time? Really? <laughs> but since I have so much footage of this step, since it took so very long, I think this is the perfect time to talk about today's sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community specifically for creators with tens of thousands of videos focusing on everything from drawing to design to photography and even business. Premium membership starts at less than $10 a month for an annual subscription and offers you unlimited access to all their classes so you can watch and enjoy as many as you like. Whether your goal is improving an existing skill or learning something completely new, they definitely have classes for you. I know I'm always enjoying their videos focused on editing and solving, or at least better understanding, the mystery that is Adobe Lightroom. And they have quite literally hundreds of classes on that topic. There are already 7 million creators using Skillshare, and if you'd like to join them, there's a link in the description box that gives the first 500 people who use it two months of premium membership for free. So you can try it out and see what you think. Thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring this video and thank you to the magic of editing. All the hoops and tapes are now sewn together. So I am absolutely ecstatic to report that I finished tagging all of the bands together for the hoop skirt. So it is now all in one piece and I'm so excited. I just did the best fitting I possibly can considering it doesn't have a waistband yet and I really like the shape of it. I'm glad I went for the larger size because I think it really works with my proportions and now I am really excited to get this finished so I can make a petticoat and then a dress to go over top of it. Usually when I make foundation garments, they're kind of an obstacle in the way of making something that I really want to sew. But this I started out not even having an idea for what I would put over top of it. Uh, I just knew it would be a fun project for the sponsorship and hopefully for you guys to watch, as well as something that I know I will get used out of in the future. But I'm going fabric shopping tomorrow and I'm totally getting material to make something to go over top of this because I love it too much not to. But it still needs a waistband. So I got that cut out and I know I have footage of cutting it out. I also marked the placement for all of the tapes to be sewn down to so they'll be evenly spaced around the waist, as well as the allowance uh, for the overlapping at the front for the closure. So that's all set and the waistband is just going to be a piece of of the boning channel. I'm not going to be adding boning, I'm just using that as a base. Then I'm going to put twill tape over top of it. So it'll be super simple, or at least hopefully it will be super simple. I don't want to jinx anything. But first I have to cut all of these tapes down so they are three and a half inches long. So that is going to be my current task. Here is that waistband footage. As I said, it's just a strip of boning casing, and I cut this to be a couple inches longer than my waist measurement. Then evenly marked 12 points, which are where the vertical tapes will be stitched to, and I believe these were spaced two and a quarter inches apart. But it will obviously depend on the number of tapes you have and what your waist measurement is. So I trimmed down all of the tapes, and then I pinned them onto the waistband according to the markings I made a minute ago, and now I have to get this through my sewing machine to secure the tapes, which will be interesting. I'm going to try and film it, but I have a feeling all the hoops are going to get in the way because this collapses down, but it doesn't collapse down in a way that is handy to get it through a sewing machine. So it's probably going to end up hitting the tripod, and I don't know how much I'll be able to capture, but I will definitely show you what it looks like when I'm done. This was actually much easier to sew on than I had expected, though I did have to stop a lot to maneuver the hoops and place the tripod a bit further back than usual. 
Now I'm folding the ends of the waist tape inward so the ends are neatly finished and whip stitching them down. I'm also carrying that stitching, though making it much looser, around the top edge to secure the boning casing to the twill tape that I stitched over top. I thought my machine stitching had caught both layers, but it hadn't, and I didn't want to feed it under my sewing machine foot again, so I just did it by hand. The last step are closures, and I'm using a skirt hook for this, which is a larger hook and bar closure. It fits the waist tape perfectly. And after a bath to get rid of the marking pen marks on the hoop skirt, it was complete. So now it is time for the summary where I share my thoughts and feelings on this project. And to be honest, they're really, really positive. As I said at the beginning, hoop skirts and cage crinolines are something that really intimidate me. And I think whenever you're brave enough to make something and put time and effort into something that you find intimidating, you should be proud of yourself. So I'm proud of myself for that, and I'm also really pleased that I ended up with something that is functional and symmetrical and I think will work really well underneath an 1850s evening gown. That was really the goal of making this. and that is what I've ended up with, so I definitely consider this a success. And all the things that I feel I did wrong on this project are definitely something that I could correct and improve upon when making similar things in the future. So even my mistakes don't really get me down with this particular project. And if you're wondering what those mistakes are, the main ones would be not pinning all the hoops into position before I started sewing any down. Uh, as you saw in the video, there was a point when I didn't like the shape of it, and luckily I'd pinned everything so I could move the hoops around and adjust it to better suit the shape I wanted. And I wish I had intended on doing that in the first place and done that for all of the hoops. Then I think I could have fiddled around and gotten an even better shaped hoop skirt. And that could kind of act as a mock-up. I also could have saved myself a lot of time and effort if I'd planned out how far apart I wanted the hoops to be beforehand and then marked that onto the twill tapes and actually sewn little pockets into the twill tapes for the hoops to run through. Then I wouldn't have had to spend nearly as much time hand sewing everything together. But I also think the way I did it is more historically correct, so I'm not too upset about it. It didn't end up taking that long, it's just looking back I realized ways I could have speeded up the process but I'd been a little bit more careful about planning things out ahead of time. So there are definitely things that I wish I'd done differently and things I would do differently in the future, but overall I'm really happy with how this turned out. I have a functional, wearable cage crinoline which will serve as a wonderful foundation for many dresses to come, and I'm really excited about making those dresses. If you enjoyed this video then giving it a like and a comment really helps me out. If you're interested in seeing me make an elliptical hoop skirt as well as a bustled style hoop skirt from the 1870s, then you should definitely subscribe. I'm also planning on documenting making dresses to go over top of those crinolines and hoop skirts in vlogs in the future, and I plan on documenting the process of making a petticoat and a corset to go with my new hoop skirts. So if that interests you, then you should subscribe and keep an eye out because I have an Easter special video that will be coming out this Sunday. So I shall see you all then, and thank you so much for watching. And to Skillshare for sponsoring this video, because I really appreciate that. <laughs>